Hello and welcome to Bay College's video lectures for Math 095, Basic Algebra. We're going to look at section 5.9, which is application. And we're going to deal with interest, distance, and cost. And at the end, uh, we'll review uh, calculating averages as well. So the first one we're going to look at is interest. And in the previous section, if you've watched that video, we reviewed some formulas that we should be familiar with. So as soon as I hear interest, and the key word here is simple interest, I'm going to know the formula that I need to use. And I'm going to write it down right now. We should be able to recall that interest, simple interest, is principal times rate times time. Interest is principal times rate times time. And we understand which, what these variables stand for. All right, so if we read this here, it says Betty invests an amount of money at 10% simple interest. And that's our equation and twice that amount at 12% if her total interest is $2,890 after one year, how much did she invest at each rate? So we read it the first time to make sure we understand it and we have the proper tools we need to solve the equation or to solve the application. So now we have to determine, OK, what's the given information? An amount of money at 10%. I know that some money is invested at 10%. And twice the amount is at 12%. So I know that this will be twice the amount in 10% will be put into 12%. If the total interest is 2,890, total, I know if I add things together, I get a total. And that total is 2,890. So this is good given information. And I know that it's one year's time. So I'm told something about time. I'm told something about rates. I'm told something about interest. But I'm not told about principal. So now when I read it a third time, I know, OK, my variable here is principal. So I have to assign a variable to it. So let's reread it for the third time. Betty invests an amount of money at 10%. Twice that amount at 12%. So if I don't know what this is, Let's call that x. This is twice that amount. So this I'm going to call 2x. I've assigned my variable. And now I can start building my equation. Well, before I do that, I'm going to rewrite my formula. Interest equals principal times rate times time. Some people like to work with tables. And we can actually build a table out of the equation that we're using. So <clears throat> what I know is the principal at 10%, we called that our variable. And we know our time is 1. And we know the other account is at 12%. That represents our rate. And we know that's twice the amount of this, two of these x's. And our time is 1. And then we're told the total interest. So if this is some interest at 10%, and this is some interest at 12%, total tells me to add. If I add them together, I will get a total interest of $2,890. Now, if we think about this in terms of a table, so this was our equation. And we just separated all of our variables. And so I can say, OK, well, this interest, which is this value, x times 10% times 1. Well, we know when we work with percents that we have to have this as a decimal. So I'm going to write it over here. 10% times x, or x times 10%, is 0.1 times x. That's this right here. Times 1, well, 1 doesn't change the value. 2x times 12%, I'm going to write that here. 2x times 12%, which is 0.012. We just convert that percent. And maybe I can do some simplifying here. 2 times 0.12 is 0.24 times x. All right, now what is this? How do I build the equation from here? I did a little bit of simplifying. So this value and this value, because I want them as numbers. I look at my table here, and it says this interest, which is that times that, plus this interest is my total interest. So now I'm ready to put that information together. This is my interest. This is my interest. If I total them, I add them together. 
and I get this 2,890. And now I'm ready to solve the equation. I did the hardest part, and that was to build the equation. The easy part is solving it, because we're getting familiar by practicing many of these linear equations. And we're familiar with decimals. And these are like terms. We can combine them and then divide by that coefficient. So I'll let you take it from here to find that value of how much she invested. But be careful. Always go back and say, am I answering the question? Each rate. So x represents just one of them. I have to double it. You're looking for two answers, this principle and this principle. How much was invested at each rate? What are your two principles? All right, let's look at another example here. This one deals with distance. So maybe we want to recall, what is the distance formula? Well, distance equals rate times time. So a bus traveled on a level road for three hours at a speed of 20 miles per hour faster than it traveled on a winding road. The time spent on the winding road was four hours. Find the speed on the level road if the total distance was 305 miles. Sometimes an application problem is hard to visualize. So maybe making a drawing will help us visualize that. So if I look at the problem and I say, OK, on a nice level road, we travel some distance. And then we get to an area where the road gets a little winding. It's a winding road. And now I kind of, I'm starting to picture it. This is my drawing, even as, as simplistic as it is. So what we want to do is maybe apply the given information now. I'm comfortable with the terminology. I'm starting to develop a picture. We read it a second time. A bus traveled on a level road for three hours. So for three hours on the level road, I'm going to write three hours. That's the time, my representation t, of time. And then if we read further, we see, OK, it was four hours on the winding road. So we're getting that mental picture. I'm told something about rate as well, my rate. So on the level road, it was 20 miles per hour faster than on the winding road. So the winding road. And the level road, this was 20 miles an hour faster than this. So I don't know what this rate is, so this is what I'm going to call my variable, r. But I do know that this is going to be r plus 20. So I have these rates. We're also told that the total distance was 305 miles. So I know that this total distance is 305 miles. So let's think about what we're given. This is where we really use critical thinking. If we're not going to use a table, we think about what information are we given. I'm given a rate and a time. I'm given a rate and a time. And that, even though it contains a variable, it is given information. And I'm told a total distance. So if I have a distance plus a distance, I will get a total distance. Here's where we can initiate that formula. Distance is rate times time. So if I have a rate and I travel at that speed for some time, it's a distance. So I can rewrite this equation just thinking about it. Rate times time plus another rate times time is a distance. I'm adding together two distances a total distance. So now let's put what we know into this right here. I have a rate of r plus 20, rate times time. Well, 3 times r plus 20. And I'm going to add that to my other rate times time. Well, 4 times r equals the total distance, which was given information, 305. So I apologize for this being a little sloppy here. I have 3 times the quantity r plus 20 plus 4r equals 305. I built my equation. That was the hard part. And it took a lot of brain power and association and visualization and really thinking about what we're actually putting together. And now I can go ahead and solve this. So I can eliminate parentheses with the distributive property. 
I can combine like terms. 3r's and 4r's is 7r's. I can now subtract 60 from both sides. And if I do that, 7r equals, this will be 245. And now I can divide both sides by 7, undo that math. So let's see, this 7 go, well, let's actually show it. 7 goes into 24 three times with a remainder of 3. And 7 goes into 35 five times. So 35 represents r. Now here's where I have to be careful. 35 what? Always remember units, 35 miles per hour. That's our units of rate. Now r represents the distance on the winding road. So when I read this, I have to answer the question. It says a bus traveled on a level road for three hours at a speed 20 faster than the winding road. The time spent on the winding road was four hours. Find the speed on the level road. Well, this is my level road. And my illustration draws me to that. So I know it's r plus 20. I found r, which is the winding road. So I can take 35 plus 20 to get 55. And I'm going to remember those units, miles per hour. And we can write miles per hour just like that. So we travel at 55 miles per hour on the nice straight level road. And hopefully we think about it and say, does that make sense? Is that a reasonable speed to be going? Well, if you're on a bus, 55 miles an hour, OK, that's a reasonable speed. We're not going 700. It's not a jet plane, right? So hopefully we use some of these strategies. You could use a table. You could use an illustration. Whatever you're comfortable with, you have to determine that yourself and then use that method. All right, <clears throat> let's look at money. Now, money is something that most people are familiar with. Um, we're going to look at US currency, of course. Uh, nickels, well, we know what a nickel is. And if we were doing the relationship between nickels and cents, well, uh, one nickel is the same as 5 cents. So we know their value. One nickel is 5 cents. So we can do conversions like that. So if we think, well, if this is 5 and that's uh, one penny for, I'd need five of them to equal one nickel, we understand that relationship. But what if I had uh, x minus 1 nickels? How many cents would that be? Well, if I wanted to know that, we have to know the value. The value times the quantity. I'm telling you the quantity. I have x minus 1 nickels. And I know its value is 5 cents. So what I can do is say, well, the value under the cents would be 5 times that quantity. So that's how many cents I would have, because the value times the quantity is the total amount. So we have a little formula we can use when it comes to money. If we know the value of the money, the denomination, times the number that we have, the quantity, we will know its total value. So we can say v times q equals t. Let's look at an application. Let's say a teller at a bank is counting 20s and 50s, or $20 and $50 bills. There are six times more 20s than 50s. The total amount is 3,910. How many of each type of bill does the teller count? Well, let's think of this in terms of value and quantity. So I have a value for each bill, $20. I have a value for each bill, $50. How many of each do I have? Well, I'm told this statement here, there are six times more 20s than 50s. Well, I don't know the number of 50s, but I know a relationship. There are six times more 20s than there are 50s. And then we're told the total amount is 3,910. Well, total means I'd have to add these together. Quantity, or excuse me, quantity times value, quantity times value. A total means I've got to add them together to get a total value. So if I do add these together, this times this, this times that, the value times the quantity, if I total them, I will get a 
total amount of 3,910. Now let me just kind of organize this, because I started out uh, vertically and then moved horizontally. $20 times quantity, value times quantity, plus value times quantity equals a total amount. And now we can go ahead and solve that. 20 times 6 is 120x. 50 times x, of course, is 50x. 39, 10. So these are like terms. We can combine them. I'll let you take it from here, because if you're doing enough of the practice, you should be very familiar with this. So I'll let you finish. All right. I said we were going to introduce average if we're not already familiar with averages. How we find an average is the sum of the numbers. We just add them all up, because that's what sum tells me. And I divide it by the quantity quantity of numbers. Some people might say the number of numbers. How many numbers do we have? That's what we're going to divide by. So it's the sum divided by the number of numbers. So let's say we want to find our exam average. So we have exam scores of 70, 85, 90, and 91. So maybe we started out with you know, not studying enough, and we realized that after the first test. And we've been continually increasing because we're putting in the time uh, required. So that's good news, right? And we want to find the average exam score. Well, to find an average, we have to sum all these values up. So I'm just going to skip the step, but 70 plus 85 is 155, plus 90 is one, uh, or excuse me, 245, plus 91 is 336. Now, I found the sum of the numbers. Now I have to divide it by the quantity of numbers, or the number of numbers. 1, 2, 3, 4. I have four numbers. I'm going to divide it by 4. So to find that average, I just do this division. 4 goes into 33 8 times with a remainder of 1. 4 goes into 16 4 times with no remainder. Or you could write it out long division if you choose. That's short. So we get 84. 84 is our exam average. So if this is out of 100%, we're doing pretty well. That's a B. And a B is something very respectable. So, all right, we're going to look at one more uh, application when it comes to percents. We're going to look at percent profit. Percent profit can be found by taking the profit we make divided by the principal that we started with times 100. Because it is a percent, we want it to be per 100. And that'll give us percent profit. So what does that mean? Well, let's look at an application. We have two different uh, investments. And we want to compare them and say, what was the better investment? So 450 was made as a profit by investing $900. Well, this was my profit. This is what I invested. That's called the principal. So I'm just going to take. 450 and divide it by 900. I want to find that percent. Well, because it is a percent, I'm going to multiply it by 100. That's essentially that formula. The profit divided by the principal times 100 is the percent profit, because we want to have our answer as a percent. All right, well, let's actually do that. Well, I'm not going to. Uh, actually do division here. I'm going to reduce it as a fraction, because I like my fractions. So I can reduce this by a factor of 10, 10 on top, 10 on the bottom. I can divide them both out. Or maybe we recognize that 45 and 90, well, 45 is twice 90. Or maybe I see that, oh, they're both divisible by 5, and they're both divisible by 9. Do it whatever way you want. But this is going to reduce to 1 half, or 0 0.5. 0 0.5 times 100 is 50 half of 100. So I know I skipped steps, but hopefully you're getting familiar and you're practicing and you can see that. 50 what? This is where we have to have a unit. 50%. So I made a 50% profit by investing or $900 and getting 450. Well, 450 is half of 900. Half is 50%. Now, since we want to compare the two to see which one's the better investment, let's do the same thing for this one. $840 made as profit by investing $1,200. So I know 840 is my profit. The 1,200 is the principal. So I'm going to do that division and multiply it by 100. 
Profit over principal times 100 is percent profit. So I'm actually just going to reduce it just like I did in the last example, because that's how I like to do things. And I recognize that um, these two numbers are divisible by 6. So if I look at this and say, well, 6 goes into this once with a remainder of 2, and that uh, 6 goes into 24 four times. 6 goes into 12 twice and 0 once. 14 over 20. Well, I see it was divisible by another number. Well, maybe I do uh, reduce it further, 7 over uh, 10. So we just factor out that. 7 over 10 times 100. Well, if we look at this, 10 goes into 100 10 times. We're just simplifying. So I'd get 10 times 7, which is 70. And we don't forget units percents. So if we do this, we'd get 70%. Now, since our initial goal was to compare the two, which one was the better investment, obviously getting a 70% profit is far better than a 50% profit. So keep in mind how we find a percent profit. The profit we made divided by the principal we invested times 100 to make it a percent. So this has been section 5.7 percents. Thank you for watching.